gave us had hoped for, I had especially hoped for. He was the consensus choice of the students, the faculty, the staff, the board, and the alumni. I think that that's rare, that any institution would be able to come to a position like that. I think it speaks well of the school and the foundation that Ray laid down for all of us. And I think it also speaks very well of Neil Denari, who has earned over the years of his being here as a teacher and in the work that he's done over the years, um, he's earned the respect of the entire community of SciArc without question. He was an excellent candidate. He was an excellent choice. And I believe, even though it's small, it's a short term into his current term, he's an excellent director and he'll continue to be an excellent director. So I'd like all of you to join me in giving Neil a loud welcome. Neil Denari. Thank you very much, Michael, and to all of you here tonight and in the SIAR community. Um, <clears throat> this night isn't about me, it's about Ray, and um, I want to introduce him. Before I do, uh, there are a couple of announcements uh, that I'd like to make. First of all, this is the first, of course, as you know, in the fall lecture series for 1997. And in the fall, uh, the lecture series is um, put together by the graduate students um, as lecture committee members in the spring. It's done by the undergraduate students. And I'd like to um, basically thank uh, all of the students who've been involved. Uh, Michael Atkinson, Callan Childs, Stephen Gabor, Natalie Gottlieb, James Lippincott, Alan Loomis, Nicholas Marquez, David Papa Nicholas, and Yuval Yasky. So let's give them a round of applause. And we also need to thank, um, indeed, the irrepressible Keith Downey for, uh, and his crew of students who produce all the lectures as well. Thank you, Keith. One more announcement is that uh, we have one lecturer out of order on uh, our usual Wednesday night um, uh, calendar, and that's this Friday, Peter Zimtor, um, a Swiss architect who has taught at uh, both the Los Angeles campus and also in Vico Marcote uh, in Switzerland, will be giving a lecture at 7.30 uh, this uh, Friday evening. Um, it's it's amazing to be able to uh, have him here back at the school. I was uh, speaking with um, a student from the Technical University in Delft, uh, where I recently gave a lecture in uh, June, uh, who had come back from a tour of uh, uh, architecture in Europe. And he told me very straight out that the work of Zimtor was the most impressive work that he saw uh, in Europe. Ray Cappy, at obviously one particular level, does not need an introduction at all. And uh, while there are many things one can say about Ray, um, the least of which founding the school, I really wanted to uh, introduce him a bit more perhaps uh, selfishly uh, as a, through an observation that I have about his work, which I've been looking at very closely over the last month, um, both visiting and also reading about. Uh, 
as most of you know, he is a uh, California trained at Berkeley and after working for a local architect by the name of Carl Maston, he started his office in 1953 at a, an incredibly young age. Ray is 70 uh, this year. His work, first work uh, is still very much intact and, and, and an incredibly beautiful work, and uh, a rare mature work from an architect of that age, actually on National Boulevard uh, near Overland. Um, Having visited a few buildings and looked at his work, and certainly not to preempt anything that he'll talk about, I started thinking about what I had uh, learned both technically about his work and philosophically about his work uh, continuing on certain modern traditions. He cites uh, the Green and Green Gamble House and the Moore House in Ojai by Richard Neutra as two buildings which uh, were significant for him in his early career and also for quite a number of the architects practicing in Los Angeles. Uh, Ray spoke about his work which reaches out into the landscape, which opens up into nature, um, and as a work which is not about uh, introversion or the self or reflecting upon the self, but really about the body being inside a space uh, working with nature. Certainly one understands the, the continuation of certain modernist ideas at that level. He also spoke of the idea that program, uh, people, and habitation, and, and in fact quite a bit in the 70s his work explored solar uh, issues. Um, perhaps even including SIARC as a very large project, you can see Ray's work as a kind of uh, sublime consciousness about so many things. And of course it's easy to see that his work is quite beautiful and very restless about searching for a sense of beauty, I think. A couple of technical things uh, about his buildings were curious to me. In fact, most of the early houses, only 15% of the floor area, approximately, actually reaches the ground. So the houses have a tendency to float into the landscape to uh, use a kind of uh, destructuring of a horizontal plane as an Amesian house to work into the landscape. The other thing in particular in his house, which perhaps some of you have been to, and I've been to fortunately many times, there are no handrails inside Ray's house, Ray and Shelley's house. No handrails. Um, it's been probably a conversation for many years inside his household about why there aren't any handrails and are there handrails needed. So one thinks about the idea of program, people, uh, a consciousness about um, the inside and the outside, yet there are no handrails and the degree to which that resists the idea of pragmatism, I think it's very significant. Ray is a very unassuming man. He's very humble. He speaks mostly about others rather than himself. And so if one were to categorize him, one might say that his pragmatic ways were driving uh, quite a bit the responsibility of the architect. And perhaps even as I started thinking about it, was there a sort of moral consideration to his work? Um, there was an Italian filmmaker named Michelangelo Antonioni who made a series of films in the early 60s which were quite challenging about issues of uh, uh, Cold War energy, nuclear weaponry, um, infidelity. And somebody asked him, he said, well, how can you make these movies? like this, doesn't this propagate the wrong idea? And he said, no, I'm really searching for a kind of new morality because in fact, the kind of morality that we have now doesn't function. It doesn't work. But instead of creating anarchy or rebellion or pure difference, we all still do need the idea of a moral concern, but it has to be constantly challenged. We cannot work with outmoded models. And I think when Ray decided not to put handrails in his house, it was strangely a kind of search for a new morality, I think, a new way in which the body, um, 
the inhabitant was going to be asked to live inside that house as a sort of challenge, as it were, and that in fact pure accommodation, pure pragmatics were there, but they weren't the only thing guiding it, clearly separating the difference between architecture and building. And I think Ray's work and who he is as um, perhaps more than any other architect in Los Angeles in this second half of the century kind of given us a new morality and I would like to think that that's um, still embodied in him. So let's welcome Ray. Thank you, Neil. I know if this is pumped up enough for me, isn't it? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> through the years, Michael has given me so many wonderful introductions, I felt that nobody could ever uh, introduce me in, in, the, in such uh, a, a wonderful way as he always did. But uh, tonight, I think Neil has done a job way beyond, I think, my, <laughs> my own worth. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's a little difficult. For, first of all, I wanna, I, I'm so thrilled to see so many people from way back here tonight uh, celebrating our 25th. And uh, it's always exciting for me to see students that, that we've, I've known for such a long time. And it's nice to see so many new students here tonight and have so many of you in this space first time actually that I've ever spoken in this space. Uh, I think my last lecture was uh, at the old sci -Arc in about 91, so it's been about six or seven years. Uh, and I think most of you know that usually when I give a lecture, it, it always has to cover my whole career. I can never talk to the last project because the last project for me is always part of a continuum. And it really, is, deals with the same sets of issues. I'm not a provocative architect, as I guess is stated on the, uh, <laughs> the announcement. Uh, I, I don't care to provoke, really. The, the handrails were not meant to be, pro the lack of handrails was not meant to be provocative. It was just the fact that uh, I placed the kitchen so far from the carport that I knew that all the kids would have to help with the groceries and the handrails would get in the way, so it was a hell of a lot easier <laughs> to just have one on every stair and we just lift them right straight up and it worked, it worked beautifully. <laughs> but really I also think it makes people aware of where they're going and I'm very much a, a proponent of that. I think uh, part of architecture and a great part of architecture is to make people constantly visually aware of what they are perceiving. And I think sometimes protection tends to diminish that perception because you uh, feel extra safe. And when you don't, you tend to look a bit more and you tend to perceive more. And so it was really that. And also the fact that <clears throat> by accident, uh, the building inspector let us move in right after we had completed our mechanical and electrical inspection. And uh, we were finishing the house. And then one day, I got my certificate of occupancy in the mail, much to my surprise. And so from then on, I was on my own. And I didn't have to worry about it. And now that we're a cultural monument, they can't make me put them in. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so, so much for the handrails. Uh, as far as pragmatism is, is concerned, uh, Gary recently gave me a, a book on, on the pragmatist philosophy, which now is becoming, I think, uh, much at the forefront. So uh, since architecture always follows philosophical thought, uh, I assume that we're going to go into a pragmatic era uh, in, the, in the near future. So pragmatism may be back in again. Uh, Okay, tonight people have asked me to do a lot of things, and I don't know if I'm going to be up for all of it, and I can keep all these projectors in order and slides and so forth. Uh, 
Many people wanted me to talk about the education process and what we went through and what happened at Pomona and how we started SciArc and so forth and so on. So I'm going to try to do that and maybe make that a key part of the, of the night. <clears throat> Some people are interested in seeing my work. And as I say, I usually show all of it in some form or another. So at the end, I'm going to talk about just the way I think, which isn't very deep. And so I have <laughs> a few slides that I'll lead off with uh, on one side. And then we will later just, I'll just shoot up images uh, and not talk to those images so we don't go on all night and I don't drone on. Uh, some people are more interested in my uh, work in the city and uh, urban issues and planning issues. So I'm going to try to cover it all in, in as good a way as I can. I hope it, uh, it hangs together. I seem like I'm big image, middle image. My left got up there. OK. Nope. OK, so here's my, my whole 45 years <laughs> on one 35 millimeter slide. That, now that's pretty ego deflating, you know, that you can put it all there and, and that's sort of the end of it. But uh, I, I, it probably would be nice if that was, that, that's, that's what I did. I show this and then that's, that's the end of the lecture. Uh, <laughs> As you see it, though, it goes from 50, 60, 70, 80s, and so forth. And a large body of the work is right in this area, in the, in the 50s and 60s. And SIARC, of course, comes in right about in there, about almost halfway in my career. And uh, I was fortunate in entering architecture um, roughly 45 years ago. I started Berkeley 50 years ago. And this was right after the war. There was a lot of work. And it was uh, an advantage for, very, for young architects to be starting their practice at that time, because there was a great deal of uh, many clients and much work out there. And so in the first, well, I'd say uh, 10, 15 years of my life, I probably, uh, by the time I did my own house, I had already uh, had 70 projects, and uh, 50 of those were actually built. So I learned the game not intellectually, but really by, by doing it and learned empirically. And I'm actually an empirical learner anyway, and SIARC was much about that same empiricism. <clears throat> so as it was said, Wait a minute. Okay. Are I controlling this? Okay. They're supposed to focus. <clears throat> I really uh, didn't want to, I mean, my goals were no more really than to come into the field of architecture uh, following those who were, who had already started the modern movement in the, in the 30s and in the 20s and so forth. And uh, I was content to just play a role in that whole process because I think those of us coming out of second, after the Second World War and getting into architecture just assumed that the process would be one of engaging the population in the desire to have modern uh, houses and modern buildings, and that there was not a question of the fact that we would regress or go back in time, but that people would understand uh, how much better your lifestyle could be in this process. So my architecture uh, was really start, started with the, uh, as Neil said, it was really Harwell Harris's reinterpretation of the greenhouse plus the Moore House in Ojai were two significant houses, but so were all, was the work of Mies, and so was the work of Wright, and, and uh, anybody who was a predecessor. I didn't really understand Alto very well, so I obviously didn't get into 
uh, his form of expressionism because it was a little harder to understand vocabulary-wise, and I understood it much better later in my life, but not when I was young. Uh, Le Corbusier was not very important to those of us in California at that time, and, and his form of modernism uh, was not what we followed. We were Californians, and other than accepting some of the Miesian principles and some of the Wrightian principles, that was about all that uh, we concerned ourselves with. We also had a magazine here, Arts and Architecture, which published our work, which made it kind of nice for young architects. They could get published there. And beyond that, actually, uh, the LA Times in those days had a home section. And that was even a better tool for the young architect, because every week they published houses. And they did a job in a, a very good way. Not, and not that they don't today, but today it's about style. It comes, in the, you know, it comes in the magazine once every uh, two months, and, and sort of a short um, presentation anyway. <clears throat> and when in our day, the presentation was quite good, and actually many of the clients that came from that. Anyway, the work was uh, like what you see here: respect for the the, the site um, view. Uh, normally a post and beam construction. And actually in this one, the two trees were a very strong governing factor, both in this court and then on, out on the deck side, the other side. And our hope at that time was eventually there would be panel systems that would be inserted in a post and beam system that would already be electrified, have plumbing in, set up in them, and that we would, manufactured housing was uh, a big item of those days. So the work that I was doing and other young architects were doing was, was of that mode. <clears throat> so these are just a few examples in the way that they relate to their sites and to nature. We also didn't have air conditioning in those days, and the, this is a house in the valley, and, and again, we're talking about penetration of inside and outside, but at the same time, large trellises to cool the outside area before it reaches the inside, uh, places where we had water pools to also give a sense of cooling. So there was a, a sense of living with your climate uh, very strongly at that time, and large overhangs were important, and it wasn't about style, it was about living and protection. Also, the houses were small, and so any room that you could open up and, and uh, lead into the other space was always very valuable. So we tried, I tried at least, to make small houses of, say, 1,500, 2,000 square feet feel a lot larger and give a lot more comfort to these people. And, most of the clients that I had were, were aerospace young, young uh, people out of, out of the Second World War. And sometimes they had flat roofs, and sometimes they had pitched roofs. In some cases, they were long gables. And for me, it was just an exploration in uh, the kind of space that, that came under very simple roof, roof forms. Uh, In some cases, I, I, most of my work was in wood, but occasionally I would get a client that would accept steel as part of their uh, lifestyle. Most people didn't really care for steel, and only Craig Elwood and Pierre Koenig were able to uh, keep their practices going that way. In this particular case, the owners wanted a complete view of the city, and they didn't want any shear walls, no obstructions. So uh, this is a steel column uh, building, flagpoled and cantilevered from the ground. Uh, and it supports just one big large roof. And uh, the client, when they came to me, wanted a house that felt like a large bird landing in this complete view. And plus, what I always liked about this house, just because uh, it was so unique in my early years, was the fact that the client really infilled the whole house. I set up the, the, out, the, the, the roof, the, the structure, the fireplace, and the rest was theirs. And that, that was enjoyable to me because the parts of architecture that I enjoy the most are really creating the shell. 
And I think if people have enough ability, enough capability to carry on and, and make their own living environment, I think that's really the best of, of all worlds. This is the apartment that Neil was talking about. It's actually my first job. It was a six unit building that uh, actually I, I acted as a developer on it as well. And in fact, on most of the houses that you see that I'm, I'll show tonight, uh, I was uh, architect and builder as well. And those were in the days when design build was really a no-no among architects, but uh, it, it was always a better way for me to uh, get buildings up. And since I had started with my first building, uh, building it with Carl Maston, building his uh, adjacent, and I could use his own, his subcontractors, it made it a, a, a nice situation for me. And here again, I, I was more interested in developing large patio and deck areas for these apartments, and so the upper apartments deck over the front, and the front, the lower one decks over the carport, and then the few are on the ground. And the inside unit is, again, I have a, a movable wardrobe, and I try to take a very small 600 square foot apartment and uh, give as much as I, I could to that. And just a couple of shots through it. Uh, the commercial work was of the same nature as the uh, housing. It, it also had the same kind of uh, quality about it. And it, it, once again, without uh, using air conditioning and so forth, we had to provide the shade and the, uh, and the quality of uh, care to take care of it. And even in industrial buildings, uh, I did some of the same. And, and the industrial work that I did do was a good exploration for me in, in precast and tilt-ups. And here again, an additional screening and, and sun control. Uh, apartments for developers, I did some of those too. And in this case, I was usually given about another half a dollar a square foot to try to do a better job than what was normally being done. And, this is an example of one. And finally, I, we come up to, uh, this is another apartment that I did that started to get to 26 units, and they started to get into larger apartment units. The early ones were all six and eight units and smaller. But it was at this time that, again, Neil made reference to the fact that I, in this work, began to uh, develop a system which was really these uh, cores that carried the, the structure. And these cores were the only parts that sat on the ground. And what I was trying to do, first of all, was to build on this site with the, where the rocks are, having built this apartment. And I wanted to, one, have better control. I, I talked the client into letting me do a, uh, a, a job built module that we could crane into, into place in, in, uh, on the site, and that way we could control all the bathrooms and kitchen parts, uh, crane those in, add the laminated beam units here, and then infill the living room and bedroom units and so forth. <clears throat> anyway, that one didn't go ahead, and we tried it again with a uh, uh, housing in Sonoma State, uh, sketched by Bill Simonian, by the way who worked with us at that time. Uh, <clears throat> and then I used all of my uh, next private houses where it was applicable to explore this system in a variety of ways, not in a pure sense of module, but in a sense of what could be developed with that kind of a system. And uh, a little prototype house was done that way. My own house was done that way. Uh, a few others uh, that you'll see later in, as the slides go, and this is just sort of an introduction to it. And the darks and lights are, are, are representing the, the bedroom slipped in, the, the living room slipped in, and so forth. So that was one major part of my thinking along the way was uh, this particular system. I was always interested in construction processes totally. I, I, I'm, 
I never liked the punched window, the punched in window. Uh, in fact, on the poster, the only part that I could relate to in that poster that was sent out was this fixed window that I was always sort of in opposition to because uh, I didn't understand where I fit in foreplay. I thought I was well beyond foreplay and into the real thing. <laughs> and so that was one part. And then this kind of guy falling in space, uh, I didn't understand that except maybe that's the way students feel when they're going to architecture school or something. But, uh, I generally uh, was interested in, in these kinds of things, uh, which were how you put a building together and how you do it uh, and express it totally. Here, this was all pre-cut uh, laminated beams and laminated posts. It was brought to the site, erected more like you erect a steel building, and this is an, uh, an erection in one day with not too much foreplay. Uh, this is a uh, another one in which uh, we, we these bents were made on the ground. They were craned up and then later infilled as well. And you'll see those later. Another system that I was, played around with was a series of cubic. Uh, shapes that were um, of varying heights and these were put together in just a very simple adjacent way with a ser service corridor in, in this case and then end to end in this case turn 45 for views. And this again was a, just a, another module that I wanted to try uh, in case I ever got into the opportunity to do mass housing, I wanted to work on systems that could be reproduced. Unfortunately, I never did get to that, and so many of these were exercises in futility, but still enjoyable uh, for me in the process. And about the time this <coughs> building was finished, uh, the prescriptive code came in in California, energy code, and that was sort of a big thing to me because my projects were all like 60, 80, 100 percent glass to floor area ratio and now the prescriptive standard said you can only have 20 percent and so I really questioned what I had been doing and whether I could continue to. So I, I, did a, I took a year off from doing any houses and I did a study of 14 of my houses and five others in similar neighborhoods these all within the prescriptive standard, and these all not in the prescriptive standard. And I found out that in correlating it, that the only thing that really, mine were usually more efficient than these, which, which surprised me. I didn't expect that. Uh, two, I found that the reason for that was that those that were southeast, southwest, and south facing, uh, and had high ceilings tended to gain their heat in the day from insulation and then feed it back radiating at, in the evenings and, and also uh, convection air that would go against the window and, and uh, gain some heat that way. So uh, of all of them, even to my surprise, this one that I did down in Naples, the, the, 45, the, the cubes turned 45, uh, was the, one of the most energy efficient because it had a lot of surface area. In it, and that would be this job here. And <clears throat> what I wanted to do then was try to understand it. And uh, we we did a, a a study of why it had why it worked as well as it did. First of all, the, the sun control device that I had used out here, the shading device, uh, really created a heat trap between the glass and the outside area. So that helped some of the heat loss. This also kept the summer sun out and let the winter sun in. It had high volumes, and so when we let the, the sun come in, it also would rise up to this area that's not used uh, daily. And then by a fan, this was, we didn't do it this way at that time, but we would, you could pull it down into rock storage, feed it back through the system, and be fairly efficient. When you wanted to cool, you opened up the top of the stair and went out to a deck and that worked pretty well too. So the system uh, <clears throat> then helped me, uh, got me to inform me, let's say, to 
work on additional projects afterwards in which energy became a key issue in, in, in what I did. And so here, in many cases, I would uh, usually, you know, shift, uh, rotate, rotate, and sh <laughs> what's the term? Uh, shifting, you know, grids in order to pick up the solar orientation or uh, be south facing in, in the, these cases or whatever. So uh, the principles basically were the use of greenhouse areas that could be controlled uh, using either concrete mass or water mass. In this case, there were fireplace mass that uh, picked up the heat during the day and fed it back. Uh, solar panels that would rotate in this kind of a case. So each, each of these projects used a different uh, system, but most of the time it was mass and orientation and in, in, engaged with solar collectors. And this was an interesting process for me over uh, quite a few years. Another kind of simple approach that I, I used on, on a series of small houses on 30 by 80 and 90 foot lots was just a very simple grid connected structure in which the components both for privacy and for energy were then added to the system. And so that was another one that I was, was working with again with the idea of mass housings and close in housing and so forth. <clears throat> And even on our bigger projects, like the Santa Monica Bus Administration, for us that's a large project, uh, I, I used a, a systems of uh, capturing the sea air uh, through uh, this device, taking it into the plenum, and then feeding it back uh, into uh, the building through that and trying to avoid air conditioning. Uh, the solar collectors are turned 45 for orientation and there was a series of panels through here that would protect for the west sun. It was an attempt to take a building uh, completely uh, around the clock and try to make it work uh, energy wise. Uh, used fins for daylighting, uh, worked out the module for that worked for seating and standing. Uh, solar collectors bringing in some other daylighting from the back area and so forth. So uh, the, my work is usually thought about that way and uh, it's just for me it's, it's a process by which I can make my decisions. I don't like to make basically intuitive decisions. I, I prefer to make them uh, have a reason whenever I do them. And so this, the intuitive part about this building is, is strictly the fact that it is a bus station and so the metaphor was, uh, you know, a bus-like in a horizontal building uh, and that was that part of it. Uh, a gymnasium for Loyola Marymount <coughs> also had uh, wind scoops to take the air for air conditioning. We had airplane hangar doors to open up uh, at half time. And, uh, op open the thing. Solar collectors as the transition between the old gym and the new gym uh, to heat the pool, uh, an amphitheater to uh, extend the seating during the day <clears throat> at certain events. I also had the opportunity to begin a project for Na with NASA. Uh, it was a technology house. It was supposed to use NASA technology transfer uh, the difficulty I had primarily was getting the information from NASA on any of the transfer items. They somehow couldn't understand how you would incorporate this in housing. It was supposed to be a mobile type unit and it was supposed to be able to be put together vertically or in groupings or uh, however. And so I had a systems device for that. Uh, this was actually the, the motor portion of it like, like an, it was an electric vehicle uh, that would pull it. This was the uh, kitchen bath area and then this was the living part that would have 
drop down uh, panels for extended decks, flip the top for air, had a series of kinetic pieces to make it more exciting in a little space. Uh, when Reagan came in, he killed the project and killed a lot of things that, that uh, NASA was doing at that time. But anyway, that's that left it at that stage. And finally, of this group, I had a house at the end of the 80s in which I had a client who liked all of these ideas. <laughs> and so I think, I think the last lecture that I gave at SARC, the title was Fantasy. And so this was about the first kind of fantasy project I ever had where there seemed to be all the money in the world. He wanted to incorporate everything from recycled water to all the energy control devices to parabolic handrail that I had to uh, collect uh, the sun. And so I, all the, the pieces that you see here uh, were, went into this house uh, in some form. There was a circle around a square with two sets of doors, and so a series of greenhouse effects took place. You, know, you gain heat and control the amount of heat that went in and out. Uh, I had a 35-foot height limit, <clears throat> and so the entrance to the house was through the roof, and this was actually a hydraulic lift. Uh, and the reason it came through the roof is that the street level and the roof level were uh, more at the same height. We stepped down, we still came there, and we dropped down through the house. I had fireplaces that went up and down from the living room to the bedroom. I, the bed swung out on, a, on a skids to go outside. There was, uh, in order to see the, the ocean, because we had to hold back 50 feet, I had, uh, I can't quite see if I, if I'm on it here, but I, I had these devices like we, we have at the airport where, uh, you know, it would, uh, bridges that would, that would um, swing out and so forth. So it was, it was filled with a lot of stuff uh, that could have been fun, uh, but unfortunately uh, the client went bankrupt and that was the end of this one. <laughs> so with that, Let's move on to SciArc and get us out of bankruptcy. Uh, first of all, well, wait, I know I, I have a couple others before. I'm sorry. I, have, I think this, this one goes off. Um, OK. I just have to mention this because this is key with why I ever became <coughs> chair at, at Pomona and why I ended up being your founding director here. Uh, <clears throat> unlike many of your faculty members <laughs> who, who don't promote AIA, uh, I was always a, a, a fairly strong uh, participant in, in the AIA chapter locally. And it was probably good for SciArc that I was, actually, because uh, I had built a fairly good reputation among my colleagues, and they were very supportive when we did start here. Besides that, in the early 60s, I also became very much involved in the Urban Design uh, Committee of the AIA, both as a member and later chairing it. And during that period of time, it was about, I guess, about four or five years, three or four of us uh, uh, worked on a series of studies. One was a land development control in the mountain area. One was a discussion of the rapid transit system for whether it would be, what it would be like in 1977. It was projected at that time to start in 65. Uh, we did a gray area study for the planning department of LA. And then I headed up the housing aspect of the Los Angeles Goals Council. At that time, we had a new, very energetic and very good um, director of planning, Calvin Hamilton. And he came in and really engaged <clears throat> all of the young architects and older architects as well, landscape architects and design professionals in the, in the, in the process of developing uh, goals for the city of Los Angeles. And so through this process, this, this is what, why we did the land planning study. The developers were cutting 
you know, the, just going into the hills and cutting them, and tearing down all the trees and just de pretty much destroying them. And we, we therefore wanted to do a study uh, showing how uh, they didn't have to do this, that you could actually develop uh, along uh, ridges and leave a lot of the land alone and how you uh, could better uh, work in the area how, when, when it was necessary. You could get concentrated uh, housing and then uh, you could also get some high rise in there if you wanted to if they were located closer to the outlet points. And so we like doubled the density and yet left the majority of the land uh, open <coughs> in this study. And so it was just we, 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 we showed the you know, individual housing, we showed the multiples, we showed the high rise, and so forth. And uh, we presented that to the planning department, and they were interested, and I think they took some of the principles. But in general, the developers still had their way. But planned unit development came in fairly strong at that time, and that was primarily due to uh, concerns like these uh, and Calvin Hamilton certainly was supportive of this. Uh, the gray area study that we did for them was about, gray areas are just the areas that are uh, going down and, and being, could use re rejuvenation. And uh, they were largely around central Los Angeles. And our study, uh, we made a couple proposals. Uh, one was, was in the Echo Park area, and this was just showing a way that it might be possible where you have alleys and streets uh, to get rid of one or the other. And so we got rid of the streets, uh, used the alley for access to the, all the housing and for guest parking, and created the Greenbelt system to move through these neighborhoods and, and bring it together more cohesively. And that way you could have play areas out in front without the street, without the cars coming through. So this was, in those days, this was the, era, the time of, of green belts and green developments and the idea of getting rid of the, the car as an intruder uh, where possible. <clears throat> so that was that one study. Then we took the downtown area around the, the railroad yard, knowing that the railroad eventually, this, this portion would become defunct and eventually probably would be turned into uh, both commercial and housing development. But in the in interim, we thought it would be nice to develop a, a pathway system all around uh, this part of the LA from uh, the town, the cent cent central Alvera Street and C City Hall and Chinatown and combine all of these and the river itself. <clears throat> and so, uh, because trains were kind of fun to watch, we thought and it would be an interesting thing. We also proposed that we dam, that they dam the LA River through the section of downtown Los Angeles and make it a place where people could uh, in, in, enjoy um, it in the summertime. These were inflatable dams that we proposed. And at the time, this was, uh, the, the council was interested in the idea. And, and there was much discussion on it, but the Corps of Engineers said it was impossible, that you couldn't dam it and it wouldn't work and all of that. And then it was interesting, you know, I think about the late 80s that, <clears throat> again, when we were studying the LA River, we had heard that the Corps of Engineers now was contemplating using inflatable dams to dam the LA River. So that's so often what happens. You present things, they don't accept these ideas and later on they do occur. And the same thing really happened with, with some other proposals for me. But this, this was the, what came out of the LA uh, uh, study that, that was going on at that time in the Goals Council. And that was that we decided that LA is really a city of centers and that the centers should be increased and, and built upon. And of course, in this study, uh, they show the, the transit system connecting every one of these centers. And of course, if that were true, that would probably work pretty well getting covering this whole city. But we know that that's not very feasible in terms of how much trouble we're having just to get a, a system that you know, goes 
this far, you know. I mean, right now, the blue line was already there, so that was not too tricky. Uh, you know, we've been working hard just to get the subway system through this much of the city, and uh, of course, this piece is also in, which initially was supposed to be up here. Uh, if you remember that, you probably don't, but that one transportation 77 book showed it here, which was down Wilshire Boulevard to Santa Monica. And so when we did our study on this, we, we proposed a, a, a different alternative. First of all, we felt that the dual system uh, was not necessary in that since the freeway system was supposed to be on a four mile grid, as shown here, now not all of that is in, but that was what it was supposed to be, uh, we proposed to use the freeway really as, as the network in, in, to c connect the centers. And of course, and our idea was to move the centers or to encourage the center to move more toward, to the points of intersection where you would have these working through four quads. And then in the center, you would have your schools and your parks, your housing around that, your higher density along these lines. And this was sort of a modular quad system for the city of LA uh, that was proposed. And, and the, the, what, the, the type of transportation mode that we proposed in that day was really a small capsule, small vehicle, about an uh, electric vehicle that would be about a sixth or say even, that's what we proposed, and might be a little bit larger than that, the size of an automobile. And the fact that <clears throat> these could be guided uh, on the freeway, and, and I knew at the time that, they, that there was a process that you could also use uh, radar and, uh, to keep cars at certain distances from each other and be able to move them, uh, keep them online, and also <clears throat> be able to work a system to move them off, and the whole thing could probably be computer controlled. Now, the reason I knew about the radar system is when I was 12 years old, and I went to the New York's World's Fair, uh, they showed the system there at that time. And <clears throat> the interesting, again, thing to me, this is 1966, where we're proposing a system like that, noting also that most people don't own their cars. They either are paying on them or leasing them. And it seemed that the need to really have ownership within the city was, was not so necessary if it could be, if, if that system would get to uh, be as convenient as the automobile for people. So this was our proposal, and I have a long proposal on this. And we tried to sell it to a few think tanks and also uh, try to get some legislators in, uh, involved with it. But everybody thought it was really a little bit off the wall. And besides, the state of the art was the uh, transit system that was proposed. So anyway, that the, and what happened now, as you probably know, or maybe you don't know, but Caltrans is spending a lot of money now on studies of this type. To uh, they have tried. I think they have some uh, portions of the freeway out. Uh, towards El Monte Way in that direction, or Arcadia, in which they have runs in which they're, they're now working this, these guided systems. And they came up with the same similar proposal, not, not the one where you take away the private car from people, but the rest of this, the system is not so different from the one we had proposed 30 years before and had no takers. So uh, that's kind of the way futures work, when you, when you think about, and I like to think as a futurist, but it, it usually doesn't mean much because it, it, it takes so long for these things to happen uh, that usually it's half your life is gone before uh, they occur. And 30 years is not an uncommon length of time, 30, even 50 years. Remember, Bucky Fuller used to say 19 years, but I found that it's much longer than that. Anyway, <laughs> onward. Uh, so because I had been involved with the, ar the architecture that I had been doing up until the, uh, the mid-60s, and uh, was one of the few architects involved also in uh, 
urban issues and planning issues. When Cal Poly wanted a chair for their architecture department that was going to join the landscape and urban planning department, uh, and I was one of the ones asked to come out there. Actually, Bernard Zimmerman, who is here tonight, was uh, on staff just, I think, a semester earlier, and he kind of threw my name in the hat the way you guys threw every, every, you know, the 60-some people into the hat when we were looking for a director here as well. So it was somewhat a similar system, except, uh, and, and it worked somewhat similarly, too. And uh, the, most of the Easterners and the big names that Bernard threw in the hat uh, said, Cal Poly where? What? You know, who wants to go there? But for me, it was an interesting kind of a challenge because having been at Berkeley in a school of environmental design, I thought it would be interesting to be able to now be the third leg of a program in which architecture would not start out being the dominant uh, profession, but be the third one in. And if I could keep, I felt if I could keep the program the same size as landscape and planning, that maybe we could put together a, a really good interdisciplinary program out at, at Cal Poly. And I think, you know, we had the energy, we had a lot of good people. I had the opportunity to hire in people I wanted, many of whom became the founding faculty here at SciArc. And uh, I think we had a, a good program going for the first few years. What, what happened, though, is that every year I would say, don't take in more students, because we're getting larger than landscape and planning. And every time I'd come back in the fall, architecture would have grown more. And so in three and a half years, we grew from about 25 students to 350. And we, at that time, we had 11 faculty members. <clears throat> That's not a very tolerable ratio, <laughs> and certainly not one in which a school is ever going to get accredited. And we were running 33 to 1, and you should be running about 12 to 15 tops. And so the school was sort of, in my mind, was using architecture to build more, build money than it was to really help the, build the program. At the same time, we had a dean who was, was trying to power play as well, and he, in, in the meetings, would tend to um, create schisms between the three disciplines. So uh, that is what finally broke the camel's back. I, you know, he was giving me extra work to do, and one day I called him into my office and I told him what I thought of him. And uh, a week later, he asked me to resign, and that was the beginning of where we are here. And so, let me see if I can see this. Okay, so at Cal Poly, <laughs> some of our projects were. Immediately, in first, we, first of all, since it was a new program, we had most of our students in first and second year. Uh, the first year was uh, a time to, to open young people's minds. Most of them had, were coming from uh, areas around Southern California and never s seen much other than developer housing that was around them. So uh, things like inflatables were easy structures to build full scale and get a sense of what it was like. And of course, we had uh, guys like Chris Dawson, and we had uh, the Chrysalis group, Alan Stanton and Mike Davies. These were people connected to Archigram. I, I don't know if you, I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, later. But they would come out and work with us on this. Uh, Glenn Small, who was one of our founding faculty members, would in first year uh, have students make these, these structures out of cardboard, and then we'd go on these fantasy trips out to this one out to Pismo Beach, and people would fold these up, get on the site, put up their little structure for the, for the night, try to develop it in a community way, and, and Glenn would hold sessions on what it meant to interact, interrelate uh, these various kinds of, of structures. There he is telling a guy he didn't probably connect it right at that particular point. Uh, well, that led to uh, 
the, the project that became so much a part of SIARC, and that was Community 72. That was a first year project in which students were to develop out of plywood a small module that would, could be connected and developed into kind of a mega structural close packing system. And what we wanted to do was take the smallest kind of a space that a person could live and work in, a student that is, uh, as, as, as the module. And then to use, I'll use up all the plywood, not have any waste. And uh, then we were going to put them on the campus and we were going to interact with the behavioral department and have them come out and watch this study over a month. Uh, a little bit crazy, but kind of fun. And uh, so it was a r rather celebratory kind of a process. And again, I think uh, Bill Simonian, uh, Glenn, obviously, Glenn Small, and Adi Lati were the key players in, in, in getting this together. I hope I'm not leaving out someone. <clears throat> and when I was asked to resign, uh, there was a big cause celeb. I think people like uh, Glenn Small and Bernard Zimmerman and uh, the other fact, Adi Lati, and, and of course Tom uh, Main was there and Jim Stafford was there, but the first four were really, I think, pushing the students hard to, to get behind this whole process. And this whole thing was, there, there were probably, I don't know, 250 of these put out in one night and they were slapped all over the environmental design building. And they made this big, big thing. And so the president really had to take note and we, we called meetings and we had a lot of sessions and, it, but it didn't get anywhere. And so, <coughs> so we're back at the slide, I think, uh, and Tom showed it too, the same one, but this is, was our gathering place. And we would meet here, I guess about, it seemed like about every day, but I guess it was like every week. And we would talk about, you know, what, what should we do? And, and discuss it, and it, was there a way to win this battle? And uh, I think Bernard Zimmerman thought we should go through the union, and we, we, we went that route. But finally, we just said one day, let's, let's just start our own school. That'd probably be a good thing. How many of you of the 350 will come if we start our own place? And uh, 150 signed up. So we thought, great, you know. We'll... So I, we put out this, this became sort of our symbol uh, of the new school. Uh, and I went out and looked for a place <laughs> on, on the west side. And there it was. This was a, actually I, I went out, there, there was a building close by to this that used, was occupied by Van Keppel Green, who used to make modern furniture, outdoor furniture. And I remember that building and I thought, well maybe that building will be available. And I got over there and that was taken by a, already occupied by a school. But this building adjacent was available and without too much trouble, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, we felt that we could turn it into a school. So, I, once again, it was a big open warehouse like, like this. Uh, students over the summer, we left Cal Poly in April, and this is pretty amazing when you think about it. We left Cal Poly in April. 50 of the 150 students uh, decided they could come and would come and became participants in the process of taking the school all this stuff apart, repainting it, uh, and getting it in shape for school to start in October. They did this by going out and, and, and getting people to sponsor paint. For, you know, went to Standard Paint Company, they gave all the paint. Uh, we've, somebody found these uh, boxes that we were given and they were all painted orange. I guess Glenn must have led this one because of the color. Uh, <clears throat> the students <laughs> built, built their own panels. And we, you know, we, we spent the first period, I'm kind of jumping back and forth here, so let, let, me, let me stop because this is a little bit ahead of it. 
the first day of school, we really started in an empty, empty space. And, uh, we, and prior to that, we had met, oh, probably weekly, talking about what kind of school we would have uh, now that we we're free from a university. And we set down curricular ideas with the students. And we had lots of great ideas. Everything was to be tested. And we could try. And we could throw things out. And we could bring things in. And we were going to have uh, uh, we had a lot of ideas. <clears throat> And what I thought was great is that we could start really fresh. We didn't have to beat a system. All we had to do was say, anything goes. Uh, we're free to do what we want. Uh, we can make the place whatever we want it to be. And anything you want to try is doable. And I think that was sort of the beginning spirit. And the other part was, you're also going to build your own place. And you can build it the way you think it should be. And so we had the first five weeks, we had sessions and how it should be uh, done. There, these went through all kinds of ramifications of <clears throat> people feeling insecure and secure and uh, moving off into other spaces because they didn't feel good about it. And, but over the five week period, we, we did finally get come to a, a decision on using a scaffold system and the students would uh, actually pay for it and build it themselves and that's what took place. The school uh, was built with no money. I mean this was a zero budget school. I, I put up the, the last month's rent and that was it. <clears throat> the rest of it was all work done by students and by the founding faculty which is pretty miraculous I think in itself and uh, that we were able to do it. And so here we go, Mike, Mike, Mike's favorite slide, which I always have to show. This was their method of, of making the panel and, and you know, compressing it. This is a motley group. Uh, this is the way it looks with nothing there, and gradually it was built up with a fairly simple system. Actually, this, each student, I think, spent $50 for their space, is the way it ended up being. And then they could sell it to the next group coming in. <laughs> <laughs> and some of them did a very nice job, and, but most of them did, really. Made it pretty neat. And during that early period, while we were in this first five, six weeks, we would have uh, many visitors, and, and some of our prime visitors came from uh, London. The AA was really interested in what we were doing. Uh, and they came over visiting us. And all the people connected to the, that's the Architectural Association, if you don't know, uh, would come over and, and interact. And, they, and I know when Neil was interviewed, it was like he was asked a question about were we basing our program on the AA. And in some ways, the AA was more interested in, we, in us than we were in them. And so they came through. And actually, this is Bernard Chumi, uh, who's, you know, <laughs> giving a, a little seminar as he, 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 just, he, was, he had just graduated. And I think he was a teaching assistant at the AA at that time. And he came through. We had a big, we always had potlucks every Wednesday night. Uh, and this is a party with the AA group. Uh, and then we had Rainer Banham, uh, uh, the historian, who was also uh, around Cy Arc trying to see what was going on in the big shed, as he called it. And we had this very elaborate podium. Uh, <laughs> that's why he's scratching his head. Uh, and Peter Cook, who's going to be here, was always very closely connected with Cy Arc, and so is Ron Heron who unfortunately passed away, both Archigram people and very much a part of our whole process. Ron actually taught with the side at Cal Poly as well. So they, they were constantly interacting with, with SciArt. And we even had Bucky. Uh, he, the first time Fuller came to SciArt, and I forget what the occasion was, I think it was something honoring him or, or, or uh, 
a, a film. He, he said, you know, this is the best learning environment he's ever seen for an architectural school. And coming from Bucky Fuller, we, we thought that was really quite nice. And so he would come back periodically and see what we were doing as well. And then we would also have politicians and various people from <laughs> uh, around the city. This is Alan Sirodi, an assemblyman at that time. I, I believed in the, in the process of learning from more the way we do in reality, and, and that's learning from the people who are involved in the process. So we had politicians from in the mayor's office or assistants to the mayor teach courses, and we had people who were with the assembly come in and talk. We had economists talk to us. And so the whole thing, we used, we used the community as our, our teaching source, as we still do, but in a different way today than we did then. It was just sort of the beginning of a trial and understanding of how that could work in, in those days. And uh, that was all real interesting uh, for us as, as we evolved. But the students somehow over time, you know, in the first, after f several weeks, really felt that they wanted a little more structure than we were giving. We were having all these seminars going on, people coming in. We, some students were giving their own seminars. But it was, it was, <laughs> we, we had one on pyramid power, which you'll, you'll see. No, but, but there was a lot of that, that happening at, at SARC, and it was, it was really pretty great. And, I thought it was the most exciting five weeks that I ever spent in education, but they, they wanted a structure. And so we, this was our structure. This was our program network. Uh, I always thought Tom Main did it. I, on the slide it said Tom and Jim Stafford did it together, so I never knew. I always, I always had credited Tom. But I always thought it was kind of a neat uh, uh, way of, of showing the networking in, in which you would you could see which courses you wanted to take and where they would move into the years you would take. And what we wanted students to be able to do was not necessarily go in lockstep, but be able to skip over or come back or do what they felt they wanted to do at any point in time. So this was sort of a base network to work with, but it went through uh, a different process. We also at that time started an, <coughs> one, an, a night program. And the, int the good part about the, the night program for us is two, one ma major strong point was, first of all, we, we invited in almost every top designer in the city of Los Angeles, an architect who was not <coughs> on our staff. First of all, we were only uh, seven people and at that time and so we, we would ask these people to teach a night course and put it out in the community. Well, Jim Stafford did this uh, piece, there was a large poster. Uh, Shelley uh, was oversaw the whole program and put it together. Uh, that became hers to, to do. Uh, and, and this poster went everywhere. And when other schools and other places saw it, they made the assumption that all of this faculty was at SciArc. And so <clears throat> it was one of the best PR pieces I think we ever did, even though the night school only lasted for about two years because we could always get, just like what happened here in some of the summer sessions, we could always get a couple of studios going and maybe two, three, four, studios, but it, it didn't seem to be as useful as I thought it would be, because I, it, because we had so many faculty and we had so few classes going that eventually we felt we should just concentrate on our own program. We also, when we started the program, thought we would do, do planning, landscape. Uh, I even envisioned the arts and dance and all kinds of things at that time, but uh, it became enough just to handle architecture, and it seemed like the only thing that people wanted to come to was architecture. Uh, this is another poster showing, this is the, the alternative studio, <laughs> uh, which started in 74. Th these were for people 
who didn't really want to follow the, the system, and when they were doing independent study, found that it was too difficult to do independent study. As you all know, that's the hardest thing to do. So it became a, <clears throat> a, a full st uh, a studio of 12 or 15, I think it was 15 people, who wanted to work together independently. And, <laughs> Uh, it, it was, and, and what we did is we, we had four faculty members for those, that many students uh, and it still became a very difficult thing because they found even though they thought they were together, they really weren't. And most of those students hung out in the rhombics. The rhombics were always in one, one third of the school and they would test what else they could do besides the single cubicle. Um, Brian Burke here, who was the one who was always into pyramids and so forth, uh, was, was always working on the, these rhombics and various things around the school. And a very bright guy and a very interesting guy. Uh, others would also, Don Posner, he was happy with his single little cubicle, which many of them worked in rather than work in the, the, the regular system. But then this, the school finally became this as, they, as it evolved and was put together, and it was quite a wonderful uh, place to be around. Uh, the, this, the main space of the school would be much like this, but all the working uh, cubicles are around it. I know all of you who are there know what it was like. Uh, we used it just like you used this and some of the other parts of the school as sort of for multi-uses. Uh, crit sessions, uh, various things, larger lectures, and then, you know, big lectures like tonight. And there, because it was a little bit smaller than this, and we had the second level, it was really very intense when people spoke. You'd have this whole lineup of students on both sides, right on top of the speaker. And it was, it was really quite, quite a wonderful thing, I thought. Uh, and then we used it for parties, and, and we built uh, various elements within the school. This is a windmill that, was, that Adi Lottie uh, uh, worked on with students. And this became important. And our school began to look like this on the outside from, from what it looked before. Uh, the, we had what we call bike odysseys that, again, Glenn and Adi put together in first year. And students would build these little tent structures. They'd put them on their bikes. They'd go out into the community and they'd camp overnight in, in, in parts of the city. And you know, they were the first homeless uh, <laughs> traveling group but, with, with their little tents. But, uh, but it, was, it was very nice because they would make this impact on, on various places, whether it was right in uh, the commercial center, out in the parks, and so forth. And so it was a nice exercise for students to get out in the community, have the, the opportunity to build something they could get inside of and, and move out in the community. And then we also, wanted two students, Jerry Compton and Brian Burke, put together this, this pyramid. It's about a 45-foot pyramid made out of three-eighths three inch uh, rod a fiberglass rod, and they, they made every one of the connectors and uh, built this thing. And, and what was truly great about it was at the first AIA convention, I think after the school started, or maybe the second, they took this back to national. It was, it was, the convention that year was in Washington, D.C., and they erected it on, on the mall, uh, you know, and so and, it was, and it's a, it was really quite an impressive thing. And it, it immediately, again, gained a lot of attention for SciArc because it was the biggest thing out there. Some of the other schools built some smaller things, but nobody built uh, this pyramid that uh, also had a cover to it that isn't shown here, but this is the frame. And they put it, took it down and put it up many, many times. And it was so, another one of, it was the next symbol after the uh, Community 72. Uh, we continue to build things like this at SciArc. The, again, the, the, this tent structure that was uh, built by, again, the same two people and their students uh, and taken up to uh, Vancouver for a housing uh, 
conference, and, this, and, and the windmill went with it. So we were all, <laughs> but, but these were, were exciting parts. And when we brought the land up in Topanga, the first items up there, again, were the rhombics, and I think, uh, I think a structure that was going to be a windmill, but I don't know whether it made it or not. But for a while, we, we tried to do experimental structures up on the site. My idea for the site was that it would be a research center someday and house maybe 50 students and that we would do special projects up there. But uh, it's been laying dormant for a long time now, so I don't know whether, and it's been up for sale, so it's hard to know where it'll, what'll happen with it. I guess you know we have 120 acres in Topanga but up there. And our first theses were one, a modular schematic for urban design by Tom Curley, and the second one, these were in the megastructure days. These were the days when we thought we were going to have a population explosion that we had to deal with, and that, that's what these were about. And the other one was a metro station at Santa Monica and Wilshire Boulevard because it was about to come. <laughs> And that was by, by John Sousa. And most of the projects in the school at that time and in the other years were, had a, a tech orientation. And many of these were, uh, they either had this kind of orientation or they were like these projects in second year, which were environmental response buildings uh, that, in which either sun or wind or other uh, factors would be the, the, the determinant in making the, the building. And these were usually, this type of building was, the class was run by Tom Main and Jim Stafford. Uh, these were the kind of projects that came out of it. Uh, these were coming out of the first and second year program, I think. I don't think it was vertical. Uh, again, a, uh, an expandable housing unit out of Glenn Small's class. Uh, same kind of thing. These were usually kinetic pieces that could work. Uh, some planning type projects and thing, a few students who wa wanted to try Ray Cappy's method. Uh, a few, some structures for the city. And then a whole bunch of them out of Eric Moss's class. You, Eric, uh, got fabulous projects out of his out of his group and great models and the, the wonderful part in those days is that these models could sit around Sciarc for I don't know it seemed like weeks on end and nobody would touch them or bother them or and, and was, we had a real community going at that time but there were a lot of these I think this is I think this one's out of my class actually but uh, But that was the, that's where we were in the, say, 72 to 76, 77. We turned them out by the dozens. <laughs> and some projects were, this is, this is actually the old school and a project that went over the top of all the buildings. It was a, in early air rights, Eric. <laughs> and because there weren't any, uh, <laughs> there wasn't an architectural uh, gallery in, in LA at all, uh, we decided to open up a gallery. And uh, again, this was a project that, another one of the ones that, that Shelley took under her wing uh, to put together. She already, her role at SIARC, besides history, was all doing the PR for the school and, and taking care of things like library and overseeing that and some of the video areas and galleries and things of this sort. And our first opening was, was a modern architecture of Mexico uh, on Cinco de Mayo. We had a mariachi group there. And uh, we put together this exhibit of uh, Mexico, architects from Mexico. And also put out this little publication that, that, that Shelley did. And 
Um, this publication was one of our fir first publications from SciArc, and it traveled with the exhibit of Modern Architecture Mexico and uh, went all over the United States to various uh, universities. And then one other ambitious project was to start the Institute for Future Studies. And this took place at a time when <clears throat> postmodernism had really come into SciArc. And there were some of us who didn't buy in and really wanted a, an alternative program to that. And we started uh, what was called an Institute for Future Studies. And out of that came some pretty interesting projects with NASA and then some third world or developing country studies. But and then, of course, VICO, which was another uh, part of our program. And, and the, the reason I wanted to do VICO, I mean, was that uh, because of the postmodern movement and because of uh, it being in the area of Aldo Rossi, who just passed away recently, and uh, many of the Ticinese who were rationalists, uh, I felt that it would be great to have a school in a location that students could actually go see what they were being and be involved in, in, in what they were being taught about uh, all, all this uh, postmodern uh, stuff. And, and <laughs> I'm so articulate. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but, but anyway, that's. The, the, and, and so my hope was when they were over there, they'd be doing what they were doing was rationalist design. And when they'd get, but they, when they came back, it still didn't make any difference. They didn't see the difference of place that in Milano and in parts of the Ticino and in all of, in Italy, it, it was very appropriate the, the symbology. But when, it, when it, but when it came back here, it didn't make much sense in Los Angeles. Uh, but it was in a great spot, and I think anybody who's been over there <clears throat> has really had a great experience, uh, both in travel, uh, a nice place to have your class, uh, either inside or outside, uh, and a lot of camaraderie, a lot of good times together, uh, a lot of good travel together, and lots of fun parties. <laughs> That was me. <laughs> OK. Uh, it's getting late. I, I was going to go back to the, um, some of the planning work that our firm did. I think I'll skip that. And why don't we just take, uh, I'll do two things. One, I'll take you through one, one project. Uh, What am I doing? Going backwards. I'll take you back through what we just did. OK, there we go. Uh, since I earlier talked about all my projects in terms of uh, primarily structure, systems, ways of putting things together, uh, and it didn't have much heart in it, uh, I would like to also take you through one building, which is our house, which I could do with every one of the houses, and really talk about the other parts and decisions that I make and why I make them. And it's really a, a, a statement that I wrote back in the 60s. I don't, I don't change much. <laughs> and it still is appropriate as far as I'm concerned for all of my work. So let me just run these and, and read this to you, and you can see, uh, get a sense of it. Besides the design decisions that are based upon plan system, construction system, and detail system, my attitude about what a house is and what it should be is sympathetic with nature, provides minimum separation from the elements, and emphasizes space perception. Sight, orientation, and views, as well as response to 
Environmental factors are an essential aspect of any of my planning and design <clears throat> to experience each tree to its fullest and to create an ambience sensitive to light and sound are prime goals. Most of the work expresses a preference for natural materials in ornament from detail <clears throat> versus applied color and decoration. Entry is an experience sometimes directly understood, but most often an exploration purposely orchestrated. The space should move the observer, it should have lateral as well as vertical movement. <clears throat> sometimes a light source and, and quite often a sense of not quite understanding what is, one is observing creates the tension necessary to develop the desire for further exploration. Shadows, reflection in glass, flowers and leaves seen through vast glass areas, <clears throat> all add to the excitement of any space. At the same time, quiet areas and a sense of privacy must exist. Surprise and chance must coexist with planned movement and rest. I, can't, I attempt to counteract the impact upon the senses and the general lack of the obvious <clears throat> by making the construction system and the structure understandable. The structure and plan are measured, but the spaces are not usually totally understood. I choose not to ignore any aspect of architecture in order to make a single point. I feel that by including complexity within order, there's an attempt to reach the highest level of architectural experience. My architecture does not turn in on itself. It tends to reach out and search for its surroundings. It does not work for people, as Neil said, who want spaces that focus on the interior or on oneself. All of these concerns were a part of mainstream California modern architecture. They make sense in places with excellent views, beautiful landscape, and temperate climate. They were, and still are meant to be, suitable to regional architecture. Okay, now we'll just run through a series of work. It'll take about 10 minutes to go off and we'll be be quiet and just watch.
just you, you switch. I'm not going to do the other thing. So that's kind of my work. Uh, you notice that we end on, the, on a project that's pretty much the same as one that was <laughs> done in the 60s. Most people come to me today asking more for my house than anything else. And even though I did a lot of these one-offs that you saw as I went through it, uh, I hardly ever get a client back on any of those. Uh, I want to 
end tonight by first <clears throat> thanking Michael and congratulating Michael for his tenure as director. I think he brought the school to a very great place. Uh, I think it's grown through the years since I stepped down. Uh, we've uh, become more well-known <clears throat> throughout the world. Uh, it's, I think it's been a very productive time. There's been many things added to the curriculum to uh, expand it and make it um, more educational, broader, uh, more theoretical, a lot of these things. And I, I think uh, he's really to be commended, and he certainly lived up to any hope that I had, uh, other than one, that he did during this period. <clears throat> the other thing I'd like to say is that I feel really, really good about the fact that Neil was made our new director. I, I look forward to really a another expanded period in our, in Sarc's history in this neck in his period in his tenure at, at Sarc. Uh, I think he has tremendous integrity. I think he has the know-how to move Sarc forward and I think he'll do a, a wonderful job and I <clears throat> I hope I'm around <laughs> at at after the 10-year period that, that uh, Neil will be here. Uh, I know his contract's for five, but I'm sure he'll be here for 10. Uh, the, it's nice to have these changes, and it's nice to have the changes at particular points in time. I think when I stepped down, it was the right time to step down for a person like Michael uh, to come on in, and I think this is a good time for Mike, Mike to be stepping down and a person like Neil to come on. And uh, the thing you have to remember, if your name doesn't end in E, you can't become a director. <laughs> we should have looked into that when we were going through the process. <laughs> so you gotta be a Cappy, a Rotondi, a Denari. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you for your Patience, let's go celebrate. I look forward to another 50 years of SIRC, and I think it's wonderful. We've <laughs>